Welcome back to the Lowy Institute's digital conference, the Indo-Pacific Operating System, Power, Order and Rules for the 21st Century. I'm Ben Scott, Director of the Australia Security and the Rules-Based Order Project here at the Lowy Institute. I'm delighted to be chairing the first panel of the conference today, which is called Competing Visions. We'll begin by polling you, the audience. Click on the poll notifications on the right-hand side of your screen to respond. This time, we have two statements and a question. You will see that you are asked whether you agree or disagree with the two following statements. One, China supports peace and international law in the Indo-Pacific. Two, India supports peace and international law in the Indo-Pacific. There's also a question. How important is ASEAN to the future regional order? In this panel, we'll take a big picture look at how countries in the region think about the Indo-Pacific. Governments are now using the Indo-Pacific concept more often in official statements and strategy documents, but they describe it differently. I'm just going to have a look at some of those poll results. I can see that uh, in response to the ASEAN question, very high number, 84% 80, of you think it's very important and 10% somewhat important. So very strong on ASEAN. On uh, the India question, uh, again, uh, a lot, lot of support for the proposition that India supports peace and international law in the Indo-Pacific. That's sitting now with agree and strongly agree between them at close to 90%. And on the China question, almost the inverse is true. Uh, it's close to 90% uh, for uh, disagreement, either strongly or, or just regular disagreement uh, for that proposition. So we're set up for a, a big debate here. Um, we've gathered some of the, the sharpest minds in the region to discuss these issues. Uh, joining us from Washington is Alina Noor. Alina is Director of Political Security Affairs and Deputy Director of the Washington DC Office of the Asia Society Policy Institute and a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute. Also in Washington, Tanvi Madan. Tanvi is a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program and the director of the India Project at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And joining us from Shanghai is Professor Wu Shinbo. He is professor and dean of the Institute of International Studies and director at the Center for American Studies at Fudan University. A very warm welcome to all our panelists. And welcome again to our audience joining us from around the world. If you're watching through the conference platform, please use, uh, use the platform to send your questions to the panelists. Once again, you can enter them on the right-hand side of your screen. Before we get into the discussion, I'm going to pose a question to each of our panelists. First to you, Professor Wu. Professor Wu, the post-war international order created the stable and relatively peaceful environment for China's extraordinary rise. Why would China want to change that? Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you for your invitation. Um, it is true that China has benefited uh, from the current international order in terms of its remarkable economic growth over the last several decades. However, this does not mean the international order is perfect. Actually, there are many flaws and problems with the order. First and foremost, this is a US-led and Western-centered international order. When the rules and the norms were made, countries like China, India, and others were not sitting at the table. So this order is not as inclusive as it should be. And actually, the rules and norms are reflecting the interests and preference of US and its Western allies, rather than those of the developing non-Western countries. The second problem is the international order as it is, as it is today is a hierarchic uh, structure with the US standing at the top of it, followed by its allies. And China and other countries are put lower on the ladder. And especially the US has enjoyed some exorbitant privilege in this international order as a hegemon. Now, when we call the international order as liberal order, that's not accurate. It is actually a liberal hegemonic order. U.S. hegemony is a major feature of the current international order, which means the U.S. not only has the privilege to make the rules, but also has the privilege to choose not to abide by the rules that it made. For example, if you take a look at the U.S. invasion 
of Iraq are outside of the UN authorization or what Donald Trump did during his presidency in violating so many international rules. That's US privilege. If other countries did this, sure, they will be condemned and even punished. But when the US did it, it was taken for granted as the hegemon's privilege. The third problem is the current international order is neither effective nor sufficient in pro providing the public goods in both economic and security fronts. And actually, if we look at the current pandemic, I think this order seems to be far behind the demands from other developing countries. And especially in the last several years, we have seen a decline will and capability on the part of the US to provide the public goods, both in economic area and in other areas. Last but not the least is that China is rising in its material power. So is uh, aspiration for its national interests. However, China has found that its pursuit of its legitimate national interest has encountered more and more constraint from the current order. For example, the current order uh, as it is reflects a separation of the Taiwan Strait. That means China remained a divided and separated country. So if that is a part of the status quo in the so-called Indo-Pacific region, China is not going to endorse this kind of uh, status quo or, or international order. Seeking national reunification is the ultimate goal of China's uh, dream of national rejuvenation. And also, if you look around China, and basically it has been surrounded by the US uh, uh, troop presence, its ba military bases, its military alliances. Every day, many US military aircraft and Navy ships, they just come around China, making China feel very insecure. So that is why China does not feel comfortable uh, with the current international order. And also speaking broadly, um, international order has never been uh, static and has been evolutionary. And as Henry Kissinger pointed out, uh, the vitality of international order hinges on a balance between power and legitimacy. Today, the power balance is shifting uh, with the power of the US and its Western allies are relatively declining while those of China, India, and other developing countries are rising. So if the current order does not accommodate the shift in power balance is not sustainable. And also in terms of legitimacy, as I just said, today the US has become a major challenge to the legitimacy of the international order. From the Iraq war to Donald Trump's unilateralism, it has casted a very uh, dark shadow on the uh, uh, feasibility of the current order, challenging the uh, legitimacy of the very international order that the US has helped uh, create. So if the current international order cannot accommodate the shift in power balance as well as the challenges to the international order, this is going to be a problem. As Professor Joseph Nye from Harvard University noted recently, the desirability as well as feasibility of the current international order have been caught into questions as never before. So that's my answer to your question. Very much, uh, Professor Wu. I, I mean, I was intrigued at the, the number of times I saw that you joined uh, China and India together there as countries that were both excluded, perhaps in some way, from the, the making of the international order. Um, so this, this is a good point to turn to Tanvi and ask her, her view on that question, but also I'll pose the question again to you, uh, Tanvi, about whether, whether the Indian view of the Indo-Pacific, the vision is basically the same as that of other members of the Quad, whether there are some differences there and whether it's essentially opposed to perhaps the, the, the Chinese view, or where there are in fact, in fact some points of overlap there. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be on this panel with Professor Wu and Elena, who have known uh, for over a decade and a half now. Um, you know, in some ways, if you'd asked this question 15 years ago, um, I think there would have been more overlap uh, between kind of what India and China 
was thinking about issues uh, in terms of the regional and particularly the global order, uh, but that has changed and I can come back to that. But I will kind of start with the question you asked about um, where India's vision converges with those of other Quad partners uh, and perhaps where it diverges as well. I think you do see in India's vision of the Indo-Pacific um, uh, convergences with the other Quad partners, both in terms of what it wants to see and what it doesn't want to see. It, like all the other partners, wants to see a free, open, inclusive, secure, prosperous Indo-Pacific. It wants to see a region where a rules-based order prevails, whether that's freedom of navigation and overflight, whether that's the peaceful resolution of disputes, uh, whether that's territorial integrity being respected as well. Um, India also wants to see, like the others, a region where the US is not an outsider, not considered an outsider, uh, but has a robust presence. Um, what it doesn't want to see, again, like the others, uh, is a unipolar region dominated by China. And while officially India might not use the term China, you have heard India's foreign minister, for example, on multiple occasions, including to Australian audiences, say that India does not just want to see a multipolar world, um, as, uh, uh, but also a multipolar uh, Asia. Uh, India doesn't buy uh, the Asia for Asians line, Asia for Asian line. Uh, sorry, Asia for Asians line. Uh, it does want to see uh, the US as well as European partners uh, play a role and think that they have interests there. Um, and that might be considered a change over time, but nonetheless, uh, you did hear Prime Minister Modi very early on in his administration say that when I, when I think about, when I look out onto the Indo-Pacific, I see the western shore of the United States. Um, you also do, uh, you, you, the other things that India doesn't want to see are things like unilateral changes of the status quo, whether that's in uh, the South or the East China Seas, uh, or at, in territorial boundaries, including uh, in Ladakh. India doesn't want to see the threat or the use uh, of force or coercion. It doesn't want to see a lack of reciprocity uh, in terms of economic ties. Uh, it doesn't want to see a lack of transparency in connectivity or technology, um, the technology domains. I, I think you also see um, India converge with the others on thinking and believing that the region, this vision of the region that I just articulated, uh, where certain things happen and certain things don't, uh, they do see uh, in India this vision uh, of the region and the, under challenge. Uh, whether that's by uh, COVID-19 or climate change, um, or whether, and I think this is more stark and often not uh, stated very obviously uh, or, or kind of directly, uh, but implicit in what India says, that India does see this rules-based order being challenged in the region, this vision of the region being challenged by China's assertive behavior. So not China's rise per se, uh, but its actions uh, in terms of how it's treating both India as well as other countries uh, in the region. I think India also agrees with uh, Quad partners uh, that existing mechanisms, whether that is the hub and spoke alliance model uh, or regional organizations are necessary, but insufficient mechanisms uh, to meet the challenges in the region. And that what is really needed is deeper and broader cooperation between uh, like-minded partners, whether Asian or European or even African, uh, bilaterally uh, and plurilaterally to tackle these challenges and to ensure both and try to aim for kind of a, a favorable balance of power, trying to achieve that, um, as well as to try to build resilience in the region. And so working with these partners to build resilience uh, in the region, whether in Southeast Asia, whether in South Asia, uh, whether in the uh, Pacific Island states or in the Indian Ocean Island states, and helping themselves as well as kind of uh, other uh, countries in the region deter, detect, and defend against some of these challenges they see. Um, very quickly, you know, when people used to ask about divergences, the first one that would always come up is geography. You know, everybody has a different definition of the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think you hear that less these days because the countries have figured out ways uh, to work across bureaucratic and military, uh, you know, boundaries that they have in the systems. Uh, but there are some differences that India has. I think you do see it in terms of principles, uh, how India interprets certain principles or the degree uh, of commitment that India has. So for example, for in the free and free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, 
Uh, the way India interprets that is countries should have the freedom to make choices uh, rather than thinking about it as a democrat, you know, that countries have to be uh, in this considered part of this vision have to be democracies, for instance. Uh, you even see this in terms of how India interprets freedom of navigation um, or the open for India and free and open uh, doesn't mean open markets in the broadest sense or kind of unlimited freedom of speech, but that it would have to represent um, certain kind of uh, national uh, uh, concerns as well. I think you see some differences in priorities um, as well. For India, the continental challenge is, uh, a is kind of a main concern, uh, whereas most of the other Indo-Pacific countries, I think, do see the maritime security challenge uh, as kind of primary, if not at least uh, equally important. And then, you know, I think on specific issues, whether that's on Taiwan or for India, the border issue uh, prioritization uh, is somewhat different. I think another important divergence is uh, partnerships who actually are like-minded. I think India would like to see, and it has failed to try to get Russian buy-in, for example, into this idea of the Indo-Pacific. Um, so it sees hopes Russia will be part of the solution to the challenges in the region, um, whereas the US and others, I think, see Russia uh, in, in, in terms of being part of the problem uh, in the region as well. And then just to kind of conclude, I think there are differences for India in terms of how the past really kind of um, makes it see some of these uh, issues in practice or principles in practice. I think India is a sovereignty hawk, perhaps more so than the other countries because of its post-colonial uh, history. And so you see this play out in terms of digital space and others and principles. And again, because of that post-colonial history and specific issues, um, India's partnership with Mauritius, for example, has led it to support the Mauritius's claim against Britain uh, to the Chagos uh, archipelago, which you know, for the U.S. creates certain uncertainty about the Diego Garcia base. So you do see some practical differences as well. But I think the reason you see the Quad exist is that convergence side uh, really does outweigh the divergence side. And some convergences which I used to talk about, or divergences I used to talk about a few years ago, uh, have actually narrowed to the point that they're not really serious uh, concerns or obstacles. Thank you so much, Tanvi. Uh, many, many rich themes for further discussion there. Um, Alina, if I can turn to you now, uh, is, is there a meaningful difference really between the, the US, the Chinese, and um, perhaps the Indian, Australian, and even ASEAN views of regional order? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, and I'd also like to echo my thanks for having me on this panel. I'm pleased to be reminded that it's been 15 years <laughs> that Tommy and I have known each other. But um, to answer your question, let me make uh, perhaps two brief points. I think, first of all, it's important to disaggregate ASEAN. Um, I'm thrilled to know that the polling results show that there's a lot of faith and, and confidence in ASEAN. I'm curious to know, though, that whether those results are mainly the voting of those within ASEAN or beyond ASEAN. Um, but I think it's important to step back and remind ourselves that there are 10 very different member states within ASEAN, all with differing perspectives, uh, varying degrees of, uh, of affinity and confidence and um, commitment to both the US and China, and very different foreign policy approaches in general. Having said that though, I think it was quite an achievement that the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific came out and this represented a consolidation of a baseline of sorts of all of these varying positions. And I think it's also really important to focus on the term outlook because really if you think about it, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific was a response to the term of the Indo-Pacific that was um, promoted by the United States. And I think if we step back a little further in time, Tanvi brought up um, India's post-colonial legacy. We step back in time a little and think about how we think about Southeast Asia in general. I mean, we didn't have a regional identity. That was really a colonial imposition that we've come to accept and adapt in the region. And the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific was somewhat similar to that acceptance of something that was I would argue, imposed from the outside. The nomenclature of an Indo-Pacific was not there 
prior to the Trump administration, um, really promoting it. Of course, you know, Japan and Australia had that vision as well, but it didn't really take off um, until the United States really promoted the concept. And so ASEAN in a way had no choice but to respond to it. And if you look at the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, you'll see that there is a recognition of both the Asian Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. And the way the Indo-Pacific is described is really, uh, really a marriage of the two maritime areas of the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean regions. So I think it's really important to keep that nuance in mind. Secondly, um, to answer your question more directly, Ben, the short answer is no. Um, in ASEAN, we don't really see a huge stark division between the uh, Chinese regional order on the one hand and the US-led regional order on the other. And let me explain why. I think this binary many Southeast Asian states feel is very unhelpful, it's very unconstructive. Um, and as you and everybody on this panel, probably everyone watching this will also know that um, there's a great deal of agnosticism, perhaps even cynicism about this ideological split that has been drawn up between authoritarian states on the one hand and democratic states on the other. Because the reality is that there are shades of both in many countries, including in the great powers of China and the US. Uh, Professor Wu pointed out some examples of US's transgressions in Iraq. But similarly, in Southeast Asia, we're concerned about the complete crashing of the uh, 2016 PCA decision related to the South China Sea. And so in Southeast Asia, we don't really see one power or the other to be morally superior. Um, and so ideological divide aside, I think very often people tend to compare the BRI with the free and open Indo-Pacific. And I don't think that makes for a, an adequate comparison because the BRI is primarily commercially and economically driven. Not wholly, I recognize that. There is some grand strategy behind that that maybe was tacked on a little bit lately after the initial economic and commercial considerations. FOIAP, on the other hand, um, sorry, I've fallen into this American acronym, acronymization of everything. Free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, on the other hand, is primarily strategic, um, it's primarily led by strategic considerations with almost no economic or commercial considerations tacked on. It's, it's almost like an afterthought. And I know from your, the session with Kurt Campbell, you know, the US is trying to catch up with an economic framework of sorts. But the reality is that component is very sorely missing. Um, and so there are hits and misses with both visions of a regional order um, as, as seen from Southeast Asia. Let me stop here. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Professor Wu, if I can turn back to you, uh, you've, you've argued quite strongly that uh, the emphasis on, on liberal values, at least in rhetorical descriptions of the rules-based order, is a mistake. Um, and perhaps there's some overlap with what Tanvi is telling us there. I'm not sure. We can get back to that. Um, but you've argued instead that the emphasis should be on a rules-based order or an international order and even a regional order, which is functional, that, that, that it's the th what makes it work that's most important. Um, in, in, in the recent meetings between uh, President, uh, Presidents Bai, uh, Biden and Xi, they put a lot of emphasis on guardrails, or at least from the American side. There's a lot more talk now about the importance of guardrails uh, to prevent competition from veering into conflict. Uh, my question for you is how much interest is there in that concept, in developing that concept in China? Uh, what would that look like? But also, is that something that can be applied more to, for example, the uh, Indochina border dispute, which also is in danger of veering into much more alarming conflict at the moment? Uh, good question. Uh, well, actually, when um, President Biden um, talked to President Xi, he tried to reassure President Xi that the US has no intention uh, to challenge China's political system. Uh, the US has no intention to uh, gang up with its allies and partners against China, and the U.S. has um, um, uh, continued to uphold 
the one China policy. Uh, well, if he really means what he said, that should be a very useful guardrail for China-US relations. However, if you compare the rhetoric with CDs, um, Biden always uh, characterized the uh, competition between uh, US and China as one between democracy and uh, uh, authoritarianism. And also uh, in the US uh, and also in the West in general, there is a strong tendency to ideologize uh, the competition between China and the United States. Uh, so how can we believe that the US has no intention to challenge China's political system? Secondly, the US said it has no intention to you know, uh, team up with its allies and partners against China. Come on, look at the, the quad occults. You know, everything the US has been doing these days is against China, right? Let's be honest about it. Uh, What's interesting here is that on the one hand, you have the dominant power who is concerned about being overtaken by the rising power. And you have countries who are lagging behind, like India is concerned about China dominating the, the region. So there is a kind of marriage between the dominant power and the power behind the rising power. So that is what Tembe said when, he, when she said, you know, India does not welcome a unipolar order in Asia. Well, if this unipolar, unipolar order refers to China, that is a far-fetched scenario because today there is no su such thing as China dominated unipolar order in this region. It is still a kind of US dominated unipolar system. And also when she said, you know, India welcomes US and the EU to participate in regional affairs for what kind of you know, reasons. I think the major reason is that you want US and the EU to join you in balancing a rising China. That is exactly the geopolitical incentive behind it. So that's the second uh, uh, point as Biden mentioned. The third is about the Taiwan issue. I think in the last several years, starting the, from the Trump administration, Taiwan has become an important part of the US in the Pacific strategy. That is, US should play the Taiwan card against China to, uh, as a very useful strategic weapon to contain China in the Western Pacific. So if you, if you compare what the rhetoric we see is, how can you trust the US is serious about you know, uh, finding some, building some uh, uh, get reals for China-US competition? So in that regard, I think we are, we are still too early to talk about this. Uh, however, down the road, there is a possibility that China and the US can work out some common denominators about how to manage their competition uh, in this region. In the South China say in the Taiwan Strait, we have to agree upon some red lines if we really do not want to see competition leading to conflict. As Professor, uh, as President Biden uh, 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 mentioned, I think the most important thing, in my opinion, is on the Taiwan issue. And in the last several decades, before the Trump administration, the Washington largely uh, abided by the One China framework. However, uh, this framework has been seriously undermined uh, by Washington uh, during the Trump administration. Now. This is a time that all these three sides on the Taiwan issue are not happy with the status quo. Uh, Taiwan under the DPP uh, is seeking uh, to move toward more and more uh, independence. The US side under the Inter-Pacific strategy wants to further uh, encourage Taiwan's independence and use Taiwan as a strategic leverage against China. And Beijing at the same time is not a, is also not happy with uh, the policy change on the part of Taipei and Washington DC, and is trying to exert more pressure uh, on both Taipei and Washington. So that is a very dangerous period of time. I don't mean that the three sides have already made up their mind that there is no choice but to go to the war. However, there is a high risk that events may gradually lead to a choice
Uh, we seem to have lost Professor Wu momentarily. Uh, we will come back to him as soon as we can. Uh, but perhaps now I'll turn to you, Tanvi, assuming it's still working there for you. Um, the, 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 I mean, the, or, the issue of the uh, India-China border has come up now. Um, I, I'm just interested, do you view that, is that essentially a bilateral issue or is that an Indo-Pacific issue? Um, and if it is an Indo-Pacific issue, how does that, how does that manifest? you know, Delhi is, has said, as, as Beijing has, that this is a bilateral issue for the two sides to kind of manage. In that sense, it's bilateral. Um, but I do think in terms of how India sees it, particularly its timing, which it started last year in spring, um, that it did seem to coincide. And we we still debating, you know, the motivations for uh, the PLA to take the steps that they did last year. Uh, given the consequences that it's had on the India-China bilateral relationship beyond just the boundary dispute, um, you know, the, 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 it did happen to coincide with other steps that China uh, was taking that, at least from uh, the Indian point of view, um, were, were, were kind of more assertive. Whether that was, you know, ramming um, uh, vessels of other South China Sea claimants, uh, whether it was economic coercion against Australia, uh, whether that was uh, increasing um, kind of overflights across uh, Taiwan's ADIZ. So a whole range of steps uh, that, that India perceived, and there were questions about whether this was something happening in Beijing that was causing it. Another way it could potentially be linked, um, which you again hear Indian officials say, I'm presuming privately as well, because they are saying it publicly, uh, that Beijing should stop looking at India through a U.S. lens. Um, and I think that's saying that that's to convey two messages. Uh, one, that um, sometimes there is a view expressed in Beijing, whether by officials or analysts, that somehow India-China frictions are being caused uh, by the U.S. And if the U.S. just stayed out of the region or stayed out, India-China would be fine. Uh, for India, that's not the case. Um, the bilateral, you know, India-China, um, you know, I, I think you're one of your previous, on your previous panel, somebody mentioned Vietnam. Uh, in, it, it's the U.S. that is late to this party. It's Japan that potentially is late to this party. India-China tensions go back um, to at least the 50s, if not the, 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 the 40s. And so um, I think one thing India has been trying to convey is stop looking at India, this as the U.S. is causing problems between us. No, it is your actions from Delhi's point of view. And I think second, it's trying to convey that if the U.S., if that, that you know, if there is a judgment now in Beijing that um, India does not take independent action, that it's just getting dragged along, uh, that's not the case. Uh, that China's choices are det helping shape India's choices. And so, you know, if, if China actually... Uh, had not done some of the things that happened last year at the border, I can tell you, I don't think the Quad, as somebody who has been studying the Quad for, you know, since its first iteration, I don't think India would have gone as far as it has on the Quad uh, if not for the boundary crisis uh, last year. Um, so if the Quad is where it is, it is because of Beijing, not because of the Biden administration. I will just say kind of one one more thing on, on, on guardrails as well as kind of external impositions. Uh, which is one, you know, you talked about guardrails and the India-China relationship. And this is actually quite worrisome because guardrails did exist. Uh, they existed in the form, in fact, more so than in the U.S.-China case, um, in terms of these boundary agreements um, that had been signed by India and China between 1993 and 2012, um, and one in 2013 as well. And the whole point about these boundary agreements was wasn't going to resolve um, the boundary crisis, but it was going to manage the boundary dispute, um, set kind of protocols at the border, et cetera. So it would keep the boundary stable um, to let the other parts of the broader relationship continue. And what Indian officials see and have said is that they see China as having violated these agreements. Uh, and what's worrisome about it is, so in the guardrail sense, is they think China's just driven through the guardrails. And so now the problem is, if you construct guardrails again, or you're trying to put them back up, there's zero trust in Delhi right now that China won't do the same thing again. So you almost have to rebuild trust before you kind of get back 
you know, even to rebuilding uh, guardrails. The other thing is, you know, and to, to Elena's point, I think India has a different view than perhaps a number of ASEAN countries. India was a late adopter, like the US, to the Indo-Pacific concept. Um, it was, as, as Alina said, Japan and Australia that was really pushing it. But whatever you want to call it, India doesn't see this as an external imposition. In fact, what it did see as an external imposition uh, was the Cold War division of Asia. Um, because for India, as you see when you go around Southeast Asia, uh, Indians have been going into Southeast Asia from, you know, from uh, traversing kind of the seas for ages. India have been, Indians have been doing that all the way up to East Asia. So for, for as India sees it, in fact, the disruption uh, isn't kind of what the Trump or Biden administration has proposed. The disruption was actually the Cold War period when uh, the region was divvying up. And similarly, they don't see uh, the Quad is an external imposition. It was something uh, Shinzo Abe uh, deserves uh, credit for and is really the true godfather of. Thanks, Tanvi. I'd just like to stay with you on one of those issues. Um, the, and just a question here is, uh, from, from an Indian perspective, is the reopening of US-China dialogue, which seems to have been following on from the Biden-Xi non-summit meeting, is that is that something that you see as a positive development for the restoration or reinvention of India-China guardrails, or, or are they completely separate issues? And it's, it's something that's essentially bilateral in, in India-China. I think for one, you know, India sees whenever kind of it, it hears about US-China engagement, it, it goes back to just like the Japanese had a Nixon shock in 1971, there was a Nixon shock in India too. So there's always kind of this concern about, is this leading to a G2? Is this going to kind of be a spheres of influence, G2 deal between the US and China. Um, and I think uh, you still heard some of that commentary in the uh, amongst kind of the strategic community. As far as the government is concerned, I think they are now, the US-India relationship is in a place where they are being briefed on discussions. There is, you know, Kurt and others are explaining what exactly the, the objectives are. Um, and so, you know, there's there's an understanding it's about kind of uh, uh, putting up these guardrails, which India has no interest in seeing U.S.-China uh, uh, tensions kind of flare up or lead to conflict as well. So I think it's positive about that. I think one of the things that we're worried about in the India-China sense is um, I, I think there's a little bit of an unknown, because on the one hand, uh, you would think that if this suggests that China is interested in, for instance, you know, at least putting a lid on tensions everywhere, that's a good sign. Uh, and I think there are some who think that might be the case. There's another view, however, that there have been times when, when China has thought that, in fact, when China has actually reached out to India has been when US-China tensions have been high because it wants to keep India away um, from joining up, at least in the past, um, uh, any kind of US um, uh, partnership. Whereas when you have seen um, uh, China feel more comfortable about where it is with the US, uh, India has believed there's been pressure on India. So for instance, after the Mar-a-Lago summit, you saw the Doklam crisis uh, in terms of most uh, recently. So I think there's a mixed view in terms of do as a non-ally of the US, so you can pressure it without you know, any commitments coming into play uh, do you actually see more pressure, particularly given the buildup? So I think what India will be focused on is trying to trying to kind of continue the border talks, et cetera, but also at the same time, ensure that preparations are in place in case there is a further increase in tensions that India can, can deal with its boundary. Right, right, right. Thank you, Tanvi. Um, Alina, uh, turning back to you, uh, we, we heard Kurt Campbell this morning uh, saying, if I heard him rightly, that uh, the administration intends to really step up engagement with ASEAN next year. Um, and, you know, we, we often hear, uh, or we continually hear support for ASEAN centrality, whether that's rhetorical or not, is a, a separate issue. Um, can you tell us a bit about why ASEAN centrality is so important, but more specifically, what, what should Washington be doing differently next year? I think it's certainly a welcome change that there have been more proclamations of support for ASEAN centrality. I mean, the baseline was pretty low over the last few years. And just the fact that there have been expressions of support from the US for ASEAN centrality has been very well received in Southeast Asia. ASEAN centrality is important 
for ASEAN itself, because amidst the constant hand-wringing and angst that many Southeast Asian uh, watches as well as citizens feel about where ASEAN is, uh, I think there is still general consensus that ASEAN is needed for the region because it offers a collective platform for the articulation of positions um, from smaller countries in the region that would enable these countries to stand up to some of the larger neighbors it has. It is also an important platform for the larger powers to convene and discuss in ways that they would not otherwise be partial to. And so from both those aspects, internally within the region, as well as with uh, external powers, ASEAN, I think, remains still very relevant. And I think despite the current crisis in Myanmar, despite the criticisms constantly leveled at ASEAN about how it's ineffective at managing or even resolving some of the political, political and security crises, um, ASEAN has been trying. And I think that's key. The fact that when you realize just how very, very different the positions are among 10 ASEAN member states, the fact that any declaration or joint statement can come out is something of an achievement itself. I mean, I didn't fully recognize this, even as a Southeast Asian, um, participating in all these meetings at the track two level until just very recently. And I, I just was in complete amazement at how ASEAN does anything with such divergent positions on uh, US-China relations or anything else, really. Yes. Um, can I ask you just to follow up then on, on that question of ASEAN unity? Uh, you spoke a bit about the pressures that ASEAN faces internally. Just, just, to, just to get out a joint statement is a great achievement, as you were saying. Um, two questions, really. Uh, the first one is, can you, are the pressures on ASEAN unity now more internal or more external? Um, and secondarily, I already asked you what Washington should be doing differently. Um, what do you think ASEAN leaders should be doing differently next year so they can actually make themselves more central? Um, yeah, so I realized I didn't actually answer your question about what Washington should be doing next year. I think Washington should continue doing what it's doing this year, but it should also have a more concrete economic agenda. And that's what's been missing for the last decade, if not longer. Um, what ASEAN countries should be doing is really consolidating positions among themselves. I think what we see in Myanmar now, the, the little positive steps that have been made, is really a combination of really hardworking diplomacy, but also leadership of certain personalities within ASEAN. And ASEAN has always operated that way, fortunately or unfortunately, it's very personality driven. Um, in the 60s to the 80s, you have very strong leaders in ASEAN. Um, and then countries started turning inwardly. But uh, with a specific example of Myanmar, I think you've seen in particular Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore really pick up um, and really try to consolidate positions among ASEAN countries to get to where we are now. It's definitely not enough, but it's a lot further than where we were just a few months ago. And so I think if ASEAN countries continue along with this really hard work of blood, sweat and tears um, and focus more on some of the key political and security challenges, South China Sea included, in the next few months with Cambodia at the helm, um, I think maybe we can make some positive steps forward. I know there's a lot of skepticism about Cambodia's chairmanship, but I also believe that Cambodia really wants to avoid the debacle of 2012, for which uh, no one will let it live down even till today. And so I think it, it really is trying to stay away from uh, that sort of embarrassment for decades to come. We'll see, I suppose. <laughs> um, for Professor Wu, we were cut off uh, there, so I'd like to just continue uh, our discussion where we left off. I do have a lot of great audience questions coming in, I should emphasize, and I promise I will get to them, but I just have a few more of my own. Uh, Professor, we were halfway through talking about the concept of guardrails, and I think if I understood you correctly, uh, from, you're saying that from China's perspective, it's really too early to be making any moves in that direction because US rhetoric is one thing, but you need to see some kind of movement on the ground as well. 
And you were suggesting that that movement really needs to include Taiwan, which seems like a, a big ask, as we would say here in Australia. Uh, so my question is, is, is it not possible to put in place some kind of mechanisms that will uh, reduce the, the likelihood of conflict erupting over Taiwan without actually making any progress on, on, on resolving that issue, as it were? Well, um, on the Taiwan issue, I think uh, first and foremost, we should go back to the original framework about one China. Uh, this framework dated back to uh, 50 years ago when uh, President Nixon visited China. So I think this framework has enabled the uh, stability in the Taiwan state over the last several decades until very, rec very recently when Taipei and Washington decided to uh, uh, undermine this framework. So when we talk about this kind of tactical arrangements uh, as a mechanism uh, controlling the uh, disputes, I think from the Chinese side, it's always important to look at the strategic intention of the other side. If we think the other side has a reliable intention, then we can sit down to work out the technical details. So at this moment, I think we are still trying to detect the intention on the part of Washington, D.C. The two sides have agreed to uh, uh, establish some joint working groups after uh, a Biden Xi summit meeting. So I think this uh, working group will discuss issues, including Taiwan, how to manage the differences. And this can also uh, go further down to the uh, relations between two militaries. How should they uh, 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 engage each other to consolidate the uh, crisis management mechanism? Some are already in place, but not uh, functioning very well. Some has to be uh, uh, newly created. So I think once, uh, once the Chinese side fear that Washington really means what it says, then uh, it creates a good uh, atmosphere for working uh, out the details. Now, aside from Taiwan, let me just add a little, a little bit on the, uh, the border issue between uh, China and India uh, following the, 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 the uh, comment by uh, Tembe. As a serious scholar, I studied carefully uh, the history of the border conflict between China and India. And India has a long history of taking opportunist and adventurist approach to this issue. Further time was in the early 1950s during the Korean War, when China was preoccupied with the war on the Korean Peninsula, uh, New Delhi uh, began to push uh, in the border. The second time was in the early 1960s, when China's Soviet bloc broke up and China was in a strategic uh, uh, dilemma and New Delhi began to push again. The last year was the third time when China-US relations worsened uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the Trump administration was politically hit by the outbreak of COVID-19 in the US. And this time, New Delhi pushed again. Just look at the pictures, how the Indian troops crossed the river to push the Chinese side. That's a picture. Who initiated the attack? Whether or not the US was behind this, I don't know. But before Modi was re-elected, and Rightly after he was re-elected, re in China, there was a, an analysis that Modi in his second term would become more uh, adventurist, both domestically and internationally. Domestically, we saw what he did with the Muslim area in Kashmir. Externally, what, we saw what he did in the, in the border dispute with China last year. After, right after the border conflict, Secretary Pompeo went to New Delhi to encourage uh, India to push further, even not uh, uh, even even considering a war with China. So that is how the U.S. played the role in the border dispute between China and India last year. I'm very glad that New Delhi was rational enough not to take the advice from Secretary Pompeo. However, I just believe that. If India continued its uh, uh, tradition of opportunist and adventurist approach to the border issue, I think there will be no real guardrail can be established 
uh, between two sides. Yeah, uh, thank Vee, you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, Tanvi, I have to give you an opportunity to, to respond uh, if you would like to, to, to Professor Wu. Well, you never want to ask a historian of China, India, US relations about who did what. The one thing I would say is during the Korean War, perhaps uh, folks in Beijing have forgotten that India actually was very supportive of China and in fact tried to prevent uh, the US uh, from moving against China. Uh, having said that, um, I'm not going to talk about kind of the history of it because I think, uh, please read my book, um, but uh, and read others as well, um, including those who perhaps are, uh, would be considered kind of uh, more who focus on the nitty gritty. I will say, um, you know, the, the, the boundary crisis last year goes back uh, while you, the Galwan incident happened in June. It goes back to uh, May uh, of 2020. Uh, when Delhi sees, and it wasn't just Delhi, uh, um, other countries have uh, have seen this as well. These days, all of us can see what has happened because of uh, open source data, um, that you did see the PLA move uh, at various points at the border. That's what made this boundary crisis different than the ones in 2013, 2014, uh, as well as 2017, that there, the PLA moved at multiple locations. Uh, at a time uh, when Indian forces, especially in Ladakh, were not where they usually conduct military exercises, both countries do, because of COVID, um, and that the uh, PLA took steps to change the status quo at the at the boundary, uh, as well as um, some attempts in the east as well. Now, uh, we could probably be here for the, the rest of the evening uh, or morning in your case, um, but, you know, I would just say that um, I guess, you know, people can go and see what's where the deployments were, where they are, and who moved uh, what when, and would be apparent to people uh, who do look at that uh, versus videos that are spliced in certain ways to convey certain messages uh, from state-run outlets. Don't take either of the government's word for it. Just go and look uh, at the satellite imagery uh, we have. Uh, and look at who has taken these, these steps at the China-India boundary since 2012. Uh, this is not the first incident. It is the um, fourth over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and this is the most serious one. I think what would be good is for the two sides to use the systems that they have and continue to talk. They are stalled. But the good part about the guardrails is that they did prevent an escalation. I will finally say, and I will reiterate, this is not the U.S. telling India to do anything. Um, I think perhaps uh, Beijing, uh, that might be a misreading if that is the Beij uh, existing in, in the view in Beijing that India does what other countries tell it to. If anything, you just have to ask Washington. It has problems getting India to do certain things uh, till, of course, uh, China has facilitated that. So I would just say India makes independent judgments on these things particularly decisions on whether or not to go to war. It's not going to do it for the U.S. It's not a U.S. ally. Uh, it does it for its own uh, national interests. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Tanvi. I'm going, certainly going to take that advice and now steer away from history and from the uh, in India-China border issue for now. Um, I, have, I have a lot of good questions here coming in, but this one in particular I'm going to pose to all of you because uh, it, it, it again points at an area of possible commonality. But I'll start with you, uh, Alina, ask for your response and then we'll go around the table. This is from Hunter who asked this question. It sounds like China, India and ASEAN would all to varying degrees like to see a multipolar regional order. How can they most effectively convince the United States, traditionally wary of multipolarity, to embrace such a vision? Alina. I'm intrigued how Hunter Master now goes just by Hunter. <laughs> but um, that's a really good question and one I completely expected of Hunter. Um, I don't know that anybody will really be able to convince Washington of anything. And I think the fact that this is now, this multipolarity is really now starting to evolve as a reality is probably the best reality check, if you will, on where we're at uh, for Washington. And part of why we're seeing this contestation between the U.S. and China is, I think, a recognition of the fact that the world is changing and the U.S. is not the dominant uh, sole superpower for very long. 
Um, and I think that's worrying many of us in Southeast Asia. Can the US accept not being number one um, across the board? It may still retain its number one position and its military superiority, but economically, uh, it may no longer be the, the big guy in, in the room anymore. And I think that's fast changing. So this, this rivalry that we're seeing is really a product of the world changing. And I think we in Southeast Asia recognize that very acutely. The issue for us in the region is um, how to manage that um, as we hit hurdle rather towards a, a new form of rivalry in the technological sphere. Thank you. Uh, Prof Professor Wu, I think the, the question for you is slightly different. It's not just one of uh, what China can do to convince the United States. We've already spoken a bit about that but also what, what China can and should do to convince the region that what China in fact seeks is not uh, a Chinese-led, Chinese-dominated order uh, which, which is characterized by Chinese hegemony. Um, and from our perspective, a lot of what we've been terming wolf warrior diplomacy seems to be completely counterproductive in that sense recently. Um, what do you think China's messaging should be? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first, um uh, for the U.S., I think, like it or not, uh, at the end of the day, the U.S. has to face the reality. Uh, it's just like it's a war in um, Afghanistan. After 20 years of the useful effort, it realized that it has to pull out. So I think at the end of the day, the U.S. has to realize that this is a different world. Uh, but for China, I think the most important thing uh, uh, in this region is that a it should uh, continue to pursue economic partnership uh, with other countries and economies in the region. China's rise is first and foremost economic rise, uh, not a military rise. So it should continue to pursue this trajectory and to share the benefits of economic growth with other regional members. Uh, secondly, uh, China has and should continue to support the ASEAN centrality so uh, in regional cooperation. Uh, in the last uh, two decades of East Asian cooperation, China, in spite of being the largest economy in the region, we supported wholeheartedly the ASEAN centrality, unlike other major players in or beyond this region. So as long as we support ASEAN centrality, I think ASEAN should not be that much concerned about China's F, uh, uh, intention to become uh, the, 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 the uh, hegemony. Thirdly, China should continue to explore ways of solving disputes with its regional members in a, a peaceful way by diplomatic means. That is very important. And that can really reassure that when China gets stronger, it's not going to abuse its power and influence. So uh, I think that by doing that, China can uh, uh, reassure re regional members that it should, it is, a, it is a benign uh, uh, player rather than an uh, emerging hegemon. Having said that, my, my concern once again is still on the Taiwan issue. It is still on the Taiwan issue. This does not necessarily have much to do uh, with Asian countries, but certainly uh, it has a lot to do uh, with the United States. In a time, when the U.S. has defined China as a key strategic competitor, certainly there is a consensus in Washington that it should use Taiwan as a card against China. I think that is a major uh, issue uh, for, for China, for China-U.S. relations, and also for the region as a whole. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, Tanvi, would you like to take, take a stab at that one? Um, you know, I think... Elena said what I was going to, which is I think you do see some recognition of the reality of um, uh, this in Washington. I think India sees that as well. If anything, you know, um, it, India itself um, uh, will talk about how um, this is not just about kind of a U.S.-China competition, that there are other countries that have significant heft, whether they're major powers or middle powers operative in the region. Um, and I think the one way that kind of um, they've conveyed that to the U.S., and I think you hear the U.S. talk less about primacy, if you've noticed um, recently, than and even towards the end of the Trump administration and some administration documents than they used to in the past. 
Um, but I think the other thing that, you know, uh, the way kind of India and others in the region have, have tried to sell this, so to speak, um, is that it's actually good that there are other capable and willing powers in the region, because from a domestic political point of view, it also helps answer that question about burden sharing. Um, it's just that burden sharing uh, is of different sorts, but nonetheless, that, you know, it, it, it's not just that the, it's not possible, but that, you know, the U.S. itself or many constituencies in the U.S. have said it's not desirable. Um, so, you know, it's actually best to work with the region and that it is, and you will hear Indian officials say this repeatedly, um, that it's not just the rise of China and the reasons also kind of uh, uh, um, the rise of India, or as it says, the re-emergence of both China and India. Um, but I do think, you know, um, you will kind of, and I hear kind of Indian analysts talk about um, uh, the importance, not just in, in, in terms of the, the primacy issue or the objective issue, uh, but also in terms of as countries talk about the rules-based order, and I think this is true of the U.S., it's true of India. If they're going to talk about the rules-based order, uh, you better stick to it too. Um, so economic coercion or, you know, taking steps to walk out of treaties, those don't help either. Um, and, and so I think that's the other thing that you do hear folks say that, you know, it is not just, uh, even though you today might consider some of Beijing's assertive steps um, uh, more kind of assertive than the others, that it was incum incumbent. Now you want to say they have the Indian government saying this, but I do think it's true that both India and the US uh, have to also then stick to the rules um, that they say are so important. Yes. Staying on uh, India and multipolarity, I mean, India is, of course, big, big, big country with many interests outside the Indo-Pacific. I mean, in particular, the India-Pakistan issue domin has dominated Indian foreign policy for a long time. But uh, also India-Russia is interesting. I mean, I, I would have assumed that, that for India, there is a tension between Indo-Pacific interests and working with the Quad and the need to work with Russia and cooperate with Russia in many ways. Um, India's membership of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for example. But I think if I heard you correctly, you were portraying it more as an effort to kind of harmonize those interests, to persuade Russia to accept some kind of positive role in the Indo-Pacific, which is in accord with what the Quad is trying to achieve, which is quite different from what we're hearing from the US, for example. Is, is that right? I think, you know, one of the things that um, India in the past has uh, saw um, first the Soviet Union, then Russia is integral to its, um, you know, strategy to kind of create a favorable balance of power in Asia. Um, and the two times that India has aligned in the past, even if not allied, um, were in 1962 to 1963 with the US and then after 1971 with the Soviet Union. Both times, it was because of concerns about, um, about China. And what you did see uh, for India, the Soviet Union was crucial in terms of both kind of what's called internal balancing, which is building Indian capabilities or you know, um, helping uh, facilitate the building them, and then external uh, balancing in terms of uh, its own you know, Sino-Soviet tensions. Um, in the 90s, you did see kind of Russia, India, China, you've seen it, you see it to this day, I think, particularly since the 2000s, whether it's the BRICS, whether it is the Russia, India, China foreign ministers meeting, which met recently, whether it's the SEO, that there have been these attempts for Russia, India, China um, to work together on some global governance issues, etc. But you are starting to see kind of India diverge with Russia and China a number of those those issues and um i do think you know you are start india would like to harmonize those it would like to see russia again and to be very blunt india would like to see another sino-russian split and uh, both china and russia have said that's not going to happen um, but in for, from an indian perspective uh, that would be the ideal um, scenario because it brings russia back into kind of the the uh, on on the side that india wants it to, even if it doesn't, you know, have some of the other principles or buy into some of the other principles. I think from a sheer balance of power perspective, right. uh, that's what India uh, would like to see. And it's still very kind of it, dependent on Russia for certain military equipment. 
uh, which including military equipment that's being used at the at the boundary. So I think, right. you know, it is it is concerned about the divergences um, for Russia to and when you know you have Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov saying or, or President Putin saying Russia China relations have never been better. Uh, that causes concern in India, uh, for whom today China is its uh, major strategic challenge. Thanks, Tanvi. Uh, Alina, can I turn to you on, on, on the Russia issue? I mean, the report's recent uh, Russian naval exercise with ASEAN partners, I believe. Um, you said earlier that you see there's no real meaningful distinction between all these different powers in, in Southeast Asia, external powers operating. Is that true in the case of Russia as well? Yeah, I mean, Russia has a military and political relationship with a number of um, ASEAN countries. And so that relationship has um, long been there. Um, I don't think that most of Southeast Asia sees Russia in the same light as it does uh, some of the other powers in the region. Russia is sort of in the background, um, still a, an important player. But I think for certain countries, um, Malaysia in particular, especially with what happened um, with the aircraft, there are some misgivings about um, where Russia really stands in, in the regional and world order. That said, as we all know, everybody, uh, all states in Southeast Asia prefer to be friends with everyone, regardless of transgressions. And so these differences are kept um, on the lowdown, so to speak. But um, there's no doubt that because of the military contracts, procurement um, that some Southeast Asian countries have with Russia, that relationship will still be maintained. Wonderful. Uh, Professor Wu, I'm going to ask you the Russia question as well. But, but before I do so, or perhaps at the same time, I've, I've got two audience questions that I mustn't overlook for you. One is from Colin. Uh, he says, in view of the shortcomings in current world order, would Professor Wu agree that major powers, India and Japan, should become permanent men members of the United Nations Security Council? And the second question is from Prakash, who says, if, as Professor Wu says, the whole Indo-Pacific quad construct is an attempt to balance China, doesn't the fact that these countries feel the need to balance China indicate that its rise has not been perceived as benign? Well, uh, first question, very briefly, I think there are um, uh, many other countries who are qualified to become the permanent members of the UN Security Council, not just India and uh, uh, Japan. We have to think about countries from Africa, countries from Latin America. So I think it should, should be more than just uh, two countries, okay? And also this has to be uh, uh, based on our, our widest possible consensus among the uh, UN uh, membership. Secondly, uh, as for the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, I mean, in China, we don't really use uh, that word because we think this concept, as it is constructed, has a very strong uh, geopolitical and strategic connotation, uh, uh, especially with this kind of implication uh, for China. So uh, uh, from a Chinese perspective, the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept doesn't really help uh, uh, creating more opportunities for economic cooperation and security cooperation in this region, but rather it works to build in some, you know, US-centered uh, security blocks against China and dividing uh, regional countries in two camps, as we saw uh, in the past. Now, uh, again, you know, uh, when we think more broadly, about the uh, regional picture. This is not just uh, Indo-Pacific. We have to think about Asia and we have to think about the Euro-Asia continent, right? So this is not just maritime. You have to think about uh, the, the, the continent. And in that context, Russia has played an important role in Asian affairs, especially in Northeast Asia, Central Asia, and even to a less extent in uh, uh, West Asia. So. We have to, you know, think about uh, 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 the participation of many uh, 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 players, both from the region and from outside of region in regional affairs. Uh, Tanvi just mentioned that U.S. and India want to say uh, a break of, of China-Russian relations. This is a typical uh, 
uh, zero-sum uh, perspective, uh, zero typical geopolitical perspective. That shows how the Indo-Pacific concept is built upon. That is uh, built upon the traditional zero-sum geopolitical uh, 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 concept. Uh, at the end of the day, in my opinion, I think Eurasia continent is going to be more important and relevant in both uh, regional prosperity and security. Uh, why did I see that? If you look at the map on the east, you have China. On the west side, you have the European Union. The two major economic blocks among the three economic blocks in the world today, they are going to build in more and more connections and economic linkages with each other. And with the Better Road Initiative, and there will be more uh, connectivity between the east and west of the uh, Eurasia continent. And then after the US withdraw from Afghanistan, China is working with other countries, Iran, Russia, uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Pakistan included, to create a new mechanism trying to stabilize the, this region. So if we can make more progress in stabilizing the situation in Af Afghanistan after the failed US attempt in the last two decades, there will be even more opportunities for Eurasia continent to help create a, a sphere of prosperity and security. So let's not just you know, look at the Indo-Pacific. We really need to think about Eurasia continent. And we should, and when we think about Eurasia continent, it's important that we should not think in terms of, you know, excluding some other countries, zero sum geopolitical rivalry, but rather how we can pull all kinds of resources from within the region and from the outside to contribute to the peace and stability in this region. China as a rising power, as you mentioned from the very beginning, has benefited a lot from the current international order. Even though we are not happy with some of the problems, but first and foremost, we want to maintain the current international order while gradually improving it rather than overthrowing it or creating a new one uh, from, uh, uh, from the, uh, the beginning. That's not what China is going to do. So in that sense, I think China is both a constructive uh, 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 pre, uh, uh, a player, but also a responsible uh, uh, effort to improve the current international uh, order. Thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, very interesting to hear you uh, cite Afghanistan as a possible future test for Chinese foreign policy. That's one we'll all be watching very closely. Um, I, we, we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask one more question of Tanvi and Alina about uh, AUKUS and the Quad before we go, which is really this, uh, do AUKUS and the Quad, you can answer collectively or separately, uh, complement the existing order? Do they support it in the region or do they undermine it? Is there a, and is there a way of reconciling those two? I'll ask you first, Alina. I think to the... To the credit of um, the countries involved in the Quad and AUKUS, because of the reassertion of ASEAN centrality and the fact that these countries have chosen to focus on global public goods like climate change, like the pandemic, um, there's little less consternation, I think, about where both these arrangements are headed. That said, we all know that there is still concern that um, AUKUS and the Quad, the Quad less so now, but AUKUS in particular because of recent announcement, uh, may result in an escalation of tensions and, and result in an arms race. And there are different gradations of how this is perceived in Southeast Asia. Uh, but I think if uh, the region keeps a watchful eye on how these developments unfold and assert their agency in a number of areas that both these arrangements are working on, that um, angst and anxiety can be minimized and, and uh, worked on. Great, thank you. Tanvi, we're almost out of time, but do you have a, a short answer to that? Uh, I can say very quickly, I think it probably depends on who you ask about it. I think as for the, uh, for, from India's perspective, uh, these, these are supportive of the international order. Uh, 
um, and uh, exist to, to both contribute uh, to the region, to solving regional problems, but also uh, to deter challenges, further challenges to the rules-based order as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, thank to all the panelists, uh, also to our audience for contributing those great questions. Uh, it was a very enlightening discussion, I thought. We'll take a short break now and return at 1.15 Sydney time for a panel discussion on new rules. That pan panel is chaired by Hervé Lemahieu, Director of Research at the Lowy Institute, and he'll be joined by Richard Maud from the Asia Society Policy Institute, Beck Strutting from La Trobe University, and Akiko Fukushima from the Tokyo Foundation for Research. I hope you can stay with us for that. See you in just about 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.